So um, at this time, we have two presentations, one from Dr. Clem Portman. Um, he's the uh, Director of Program Management at Biome. And uh, following his presentation, we have uh, Kuming Wu, Director of Biomanufacturing at Twist Bioscience. So uh, we'll have um, Clem Portman's presentation first. Uh, Clem, we're ready for you. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Pornima. Um, and thank you for the invitation to come speak. I am Clem Fortman. I am Director of Program Management at Biomade. Um, I am a metabolic engineer by training, but more relevant to this audience is the fact that I am a product of the uh, community college system. I came up, um, whatever, I was a knucklehead young man and got a GED while I was part of the 82nd Airborne Division. and. 10 years later, started college in a community college, and 10 years after that, headed off to uh, Berkeley for a postdoc. So um, I believe in what you all do, and uh, hopefully I will convince you that there is um, room for us to work together moving forward. We have a new institute, and we're very excited about uh, getting members. I'll apologize ahead of time. This is a little more sales pitchy than uh, than I usually like to talk, but uh, hopefully I will convince you that Biomate is a good thing for, for everyone. Uh, and there's a big role for community and technical colleges and every, and frankly, everyone on this call, anyone interested in biotechnology, um, there's room for you in the, in the organization. So I am going to stop sharing my video out of uh, fear of losing my connection here and, uh, and get to it. So I have been asked to um, talk about what the difference is between um, bioindustrial manufacturing and, and biopharma. And um, you know, bio, there, there are a lot of parallels in the development and even the processing, but um, you know, bioindustrial manufacturing as we define it is the use of biology in a controlled environment to generate um, non-pharmaceutical. So Biomade is uh, mandated to be outside of the pharmaceutical space, generate non-pharmaceutical products at a commercially relevant scale. Um, a lot of parallels with pharma, but um, the drivers behind things are much different. So the technology ultimately uh, can be quite different. The primary drivers for pharma are mainly market. You know, is there is there somebody who needs your your pharmaceutical, and are there enough of them for you to invest in developing it? And then are there competitors in the market? Right. So that's. Um, the top line that uh, that pharma looks at. And then there's the regulatory side. There's a big investment in making sure that what they're making is safe and effective. And that often uh, is a major driver for development. But at the end of the day, uh, once a drug is approved, the cost of goods isn't that high. Uh, on the flip side, primary drivers for bioindustrial are market. Does somebody want what you can make? And then cost. Um, my wife is on a cutting edge biopharma product, and I um, looked at the how much is actually in a dose today, and calculated that um, that the the retail on this thing is roughly two hundred million dollars a kilogram. So. Um, Comparing that to something like adipic acid, which a few years ago saw a lot of investment in the green space, people trying to bioproduce adipic acid, but adipic acid from, from petroleum sells for roughly $2 a kilo. So you're talking about 100 million X differential in cost. Um, so there's uh, some extreme examples, but kind of gets your, gets your head around uh, the big difference in these two markets and, and what drives them. Um, for with regard to platform, yeah, biopharma has a fairly robust um, set of ho hosts. Um, you know, mammalian and plant cells are being used to make antibodies and viral antigens and all kinds of things. Bacteria and fungi have been used for for decades 
to make antibiotics and various other um, you know, analgesics and thing, things like that, anti-cancers, what have you. Um, on the bioindustrial side, many of the same bacteria are manipulated to make um, things like the aforementioned adipic acid and the emerging products. Um, you just heard about algae, there's plenty of work in fungi and yeast, um, but mostly prokaryotes with uh, very lim limited production in mammalian cells on the bioindustrial side, but virtually anything can go um, because it doesn't have to be, you know, starting without a grass organism is not going to um, necessarily kill you early on. So people are looking for organisms that make things that get them toward a goal more than they're looking for an organism that they can get through the FDA more quickly. Uh, on the bio, on the pharma side, you know, growth is sometimes fairly small, um, especially compared to things like uh, a million liter biodiesel or bioethanol plant on the um, on the on the bioindustrial side, so the the growth size is a little um, smaller, and the use of you know, disposable wave bags, things like that, um, to do small scale production, uh, especially in niche markets like antibodies or small um, small dosage markets like antibodies, are uh, becoming increasingly more popular. Certainly the traditional production of things like antibiotics and big steel tanks still persist, but um, the, there's a lot of interesting technology development going on in uh, small to medium scale, I'll say, on the, on the growth and, and fermentation side. Um, and then purification, this is a, a huge cost driver on the bioindustrial side, the real, um, the real driver on the pharma side is high stringency. You need to make sure there's nothing in your product but your product if you are going to be injecting it or, or feeding it to a human being. Um, whereas on the bioindustrial side, a crude lysate or something like that may actually be your end product, some, or some rough salt cut of a, of a protein um, can certainly work and fulfill uh, an application, you know, sometimes as well as the fully purified protein. So, different uh, different stringencies, different things to think about, different uh, different coursework opportunities for development. And then products, um, I've talked about some of these already, but pro, pro on the protein side, uh, biopharma, you know, lots of exciting things going on with antibodies. Vaccine antigens, certainly relevant for this last year. Um, antibiotics, there's a, a few that are uh, people are working on, not necessarily uh, in wide use. Same thing with phage. You know, the Russians have had phage going as an antibiotic for a long time, um, trickling into the U.S. markets. Uh, small molecules, plenty of stuff coming out of biology still. I mean, it is. Uh, bio-based production of antibiotics is still a major component of the antibiotics market. And then whole cells, things like stem cell therapies, I think are uh, fairly niche now, but going to see a bigger application in the pharma space as, as we move forward. On the, on the bioindustrial side, um, proteins for a lot of applications are um, already entrenched. I mean, detergent enzymes have, enzymes have been part of that market for decades. People are using um, spider silk, a, a protein that's uh, still trying to find its footing in the material space, uh, process catalysts. So there are things that enzymes can do that old school synthetic organic chemistry still has a hard time doing. So. Um, there are people working on uh, continuing to develop new process catalysts using enzymes. Uh, phage, some folks, uh, Angie Belcher at MIT has got some interesting work using phage as uh, 
as a starting material for materials. Um, I know when I was in the Department of Defense, there were uh, some interesting projects using this for using phage based materials for chemical and biological defense. Uh, small molecules, the application space is virtually limited, uh, excuse me, virtually unlimited. Um, fuels and fragrances and flavors and materials, there's there a whole host of application spaces, and that ultimately will provide you with a, a whole host of sort of training opportunities for uh, test and evaluation and, and looking for where um, folks that are traditionally coming out of biology might not uh, have the same, have the footing that in education that um, the employers of today are looking for. And I'll, I'll get a little more to that toward the end of my talk. Um, and then wholesales, um, sensors, certainly been a, an area of interest for a long time. Biology can sense and respond quite well. Um, it's very specific. A lot of that's just finding the right application for folks to develop whole cell sensors, uh, because once they're developed, they're very cheap to manufacture, quasi disposable, what have you. And then um, materials, uh, biomason is an interesting example where um, instead of hauling in a, a lot of concrete, they, there is uh, an organism that has grown up on site uh, to produce, the DOD has used it to produce some concrete helicopter pads on site. So they, they grow up a vat of an organism and then spray it onto a matrix and it's helped solidify this matrix much the way uh, poured concrete would, but um, saves the logistics of hauling in a, a mountain of concrete. Clem, this is Linnea. Could you say that organism again? That's really interesting. Oh, it wasn't the organism. It's actually a company called Biomason. That is Biomason. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a cool system. I forget what the organism is off the top of my head. It's in there somewhere, but it's Friday and the top of my head has got. Uh, That's all right. That's perfect. Thank in. you. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, they they have done demos where they land helicopters on stuff. It's it's pretty awesome. Um. So I'm going to transition now and talk talk about Biomade. So uh, the Biomade vision is to build a sustainable domestic end to end bio industrial manufacturing ecosystem, and you guys are a big part of that. Um, our mission is to enable domestic bio uh, industrial manufacturing and essentially enhance U.S. Um, manufacturing technology in general. I mean, this this industry can feed other industries um, by replacing petrochemical feedstocks and um, developing new products that replace petro and, and other products um, that are currently on the market. So we are the newest um, manufacturing innovation institute. We are the 16th. So the Manufacturing Innovation Institute program is a US government program that takes a small slice of emerging technology and puts um, you know, a reasonably large tranche of money behind it to develop a public private partnership that develops technology to move emerging tech into a real manufacturing industry. So the others, there are two others in in the biospace, Nimble, which I'm sure you uh, you guys know all about, and Biofab USA, which is also um, you know, one I'm sure you're you're aware of. The others are, um, you know, there's one for lightweight materials. There's one for flexible electronics. There's one for process intensification. There's one for functional fabrics. Sort of all over the place. Um, and each one's a little different, but we're trying to work together. So uh, conceivably, the things that we learned for bioindustry will feed the things that say Nimble is working on. Things that Nimble is working on will help us develop new products. Um, we're already looking to folks uh, in some of the hard goods side uh, to figure out whether some of the materials 
that we make can be fed into their hard goods for fabrics or flexible electronics. So it's a it's a big dynamic space and frankly uh, quite quite fun to be working in. So Biomade is an independent nonprofit public private partnership. It is a nonprofit corporation. Um, we were awarded eighty seven million dollars from the Department of Defense and. Um, have a commitment from our, our member uh, base of another almost $200 million. So we have a, a $275 million commitment over, um, over the next seven years. And we're looking to build this end-to-end -end bioindustrial manufacturing ecosystem. Um, we are currently headquartered and working towards a state-of-the-art pilot plant at the University of Minnesota, but the majority of the work is going to be done by our members spread spread out across the U.S. Um, the proposal was supported by nearly 100 organizations, um, many of whom are on the call, and um, most of whom are are pictured on this slide. So you can see we have a pretty good geographic distribution as well as sort of a stratification through academia and industry. So the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes in general, and, and Biomade being one of them, have a mission of working in the manufacturing readiness level space uh, between MRL 4 and 7. So um, this is essentially robust reproducibility of something at industrial relevant quantities up until, and getting it across this valley of death um, to a point where a company is, is comfortable in picking up uh, the product and process and further refining it to be a, you know, a successful corporate venture. You can see from this graph, I mean, the, the US government funds a lot of basic research. I'm sure you are better aware of this than I, but um, they do lots of cool R&D stuff and corporations do the things that are going to make them money, but um, pulling them across this valley of death where um, there's no profit to be made and there are no nature papers to be had, just uh, the non-sexy part of doing something cool at a bigger, cheaper scale is where Biomate is, is going to... Um, flex its muscle and, and, and invest in, in projects. Um, this is critical. I, um, I didn't give you my full background, but I was also a uh, engineering biology startup CEO. I founded a company called Ligos that is still um, you know, somewhere in this valley um, working, to, working to get out. I left the company quite a while ago, but um, you know, it's it's a tough space. I know from I know from experience. Um, so the way Biomate is sort of thinking about these uh, manufacturing readiness levels, we we have built this MADE uh, acronym: manipulate, accumulate, de-risk, and execute. Um, so MRL four, the manipulate module, is where we help. Um, take a strain that is working well, um, producing gram quantities generally, and help um, move it along um, to a point where we can use it to make kilogram quantities. So this is a lot of data analysis and making sure that we understand what's going on in the cell and try to make it more robust. Uh, accumulate is that sort of gram production so we can we can build out um, a case for the product that's being made to move forward. We can show that it performs the same as its uh, petrochemical counterpart, or we can provide enough of a new material that a potential customer, the DoD, Cargill, virtually anybody can go in and and vet the. Uh, vet the new product as a viable component of something they do. Um, I mean, this could be 
uh, a new polymer precursor. This could be a new insect repellent. As long as it is a bio-based material that's not medical, um, you know, we'll at least consider it. Um, and then we will be looking to further de-risk by helping uh, our teams of members pull it through and develop a real process for manufacturing and demonstrate at some scale that we have a scale up that works and a downstream processing that works both in an economically viable fashion. So along the way, we will do a lot of techno-economic analysis and simulations to ensure that um, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost us $100 a kilogram to make something that has a, a market competitor that's $2 a kilogram. Um, things need to, to make sense for them to get across the valley of death. And that's, that's just how it is. I, um, as an academic, I came up with a, um, a biosynthetic pathway for making propene, which is a, a precursor for um, uh, poly polypropylene. Um, and it is ridiculously uh, cost ineffective. It's cool from a, uh, an enzyme engineering standpoint, but it would never make it as a business. So um, knowing how to sort that out is going to be important for being uh, good stewards of people's time and money. Um, that would that particular project would make a, you know a reasonable paper, uh, not a not a great uh, not a great business. And then by the time we get to the end, we will be um, working with companies to transition these things out into real plants. And there will be um, you know there there are opportunities all along the way for education. The manipulate end. I mean, there's there are. A number of companies, frankly, the Bay Area is stuffed with companies doing metabolic engineering and things along those lines who need workers to run robots. Um, and that, that those sorts of examples go on and on. And then by the time we're getting to the other end, we're talking about um, companies generally building a plant or converting a plant to make a new product. And they will have a workforce that is going to require training. Um, and that's hopefully where you all come in and as part of the Biomade ecosystem would be able to partner with an organization locally, uh, geographically locally, where you can help a new plant uh, sponsor develop the training they need to get their workforce ready for the plant to launch. All right, so our, our approach to innovation is to um, do project calls and fund research teams. So our, our project calls are going to be, uh, and are, actually, I, I believe you all know that there is an open project call both on the technical side and on the education and workforce development side right. that, um, that closes in about uh, eight hours. Um, so you still have time to do a white paper if you get started now. Um, these teams of members will come in and uh, this, this is an open call. So we will occasionally have open calls, um, but a lot of this will be um, tracked against a, a roadmap that is being developed and, and will be constantly um, modified by our members as things you know, what, what industry needs and what is possible in the short term or medium term where we see this. So 80% of our, our investments are going to go into developing the technology that we can see, but is not quite there yet. Um, and getting projects moved across the Valley of Death to get some wins on the field. Uh, that's only going to help um, help stimulate investment in the field and help the field grow. Uh, but 20% of our projects will be a little high on the risk reward, on the risk side versus reward. So, um, you know, a, a decade ago, uh, investing in a CRISPR project would have been high risk, high reward kind of thing. Now it's, uh, 
you know, everybody's investing in a CRISPR project, but that's, that's the type of thing we will hope to um, see in our proposals is a, occasionally some new step change, um, either on the biology side or you know, much of what we're doing is going to be very much like chemical engineering. Well, it is, it is going to be chemical engineering. It's just with a lot of water instead of, uh, instead of oil as they uh, traditionally work. But um, they're across the spectrum, regardless of what kind of technical project you're looking at, there are going to be uh, education and training components. And I'm seeing, I'm already seeing proposals roll in probably from some people on this call, although I don't have full visibility of everyone here. Um, and hopefully in the future, I'll be seeing you all as parts of calls with other, with other Biomaid members. Um, as a member, you will have opportunities to uh, work with the innovators in the in the field. Be in, be an innovator in the field if you're in the in the uh, R1 space. Um, we will have um, technical priorities around a lot of uh, areas that may not be covered in what you're doing doing now and need. Um, there's going to be educational components that don't exist. I'll get to in my last slide or close to last slide. Things that came up from our um, our education workforce development workshop that we held in March, um, where cross disciplinary training was identified as um, as a big missing piece. So. Um, you know, as, as somebody with a PhD and postdoc, that's, uh, that was pretty focused on bioindustrial types of things. I didn't get any training in supply chain or techno-economic analysis. That's stuff I had to learn as a, as an entrepreneur. So, um, that will be a, an interesting opportunity for, uh, for you all to help integrate that better into the, uh, into basic biotechnology education. Uh, I will, uh, on this slide, I would like to highlight there are a couple of different types of projects. Uh, the Institute projects, which are the, those that utilize that initial government funding um, and generally are going to track to our roadmap. Um, those are open, we had, uh, we have our project calls and we do some uh, teaming. So we have, we will have a uh, proposers day type event where you can come and hear me give a spiel about the open RFP. And we um, collected single slides from anyone who is interested in finding um, project partners and consolidated those into a single deck and then redistributed it to those who were interested. So uh, we are looking for mechanisms to help you all find people at Cargill that can use your skills. Um, and that's largely gonna come through Institute projects, but uh, Biomate is also doing directed projects where the government or um, some high tier member of the organization can come in and hand us a check to uh, execute uh, a big project utilizing the, the ecosystem and utilizing the membership. And that may be an opportunity for you all to um, you know, develop coursework for a plant going in in your, in your geographic, um, in your area. So there's a, a lot of interesting ways that the uh, education community is going to be able to fit into uh, into the biomate efforts. Um, this is largely about our main site, but our um, philosophy in general about, frankly, about everything is that if, if it exists, we should use it. Um, if something close exists, we should, you know, adapt it to what we're doing. And uh, if it doesn't exist, that's where we're going to invest in de novo creation. So if you see a project call that looks very much like something you've already done, um, we are not averse to reusing something you have already developed and 
you know, helping fund you to adapt it to Biomade and to work it into an existing project. That That is a big win, is to not have to spend a full boat to redevelop something that already exists. So uh, I, I know that I've no, I know that I know virtually nothing about the coursework that's out there, um, but I also know that you all are quite well versed in what's what's available, um, and I hope Biomate is is one of frankly many avenues that you will use to get that into the hands of people that need it because I know you're developing excellent products and I know there are people out there who know nothing about them because I am one of them. Um, so let us know, you know, how we can help you. Um, I'll talk a, a few seconds about the main site. So we have a main site at the University of Minnesota. We currently have staff there uh, and are working with them to build a pilot facility that will be 5,000 liters. Um, we also have some access to supercomputing and some of their other uh, facilities. They have a plant growth facility. Um, they have a cell production facility that's currently uh, GMP light or something like that, and is is also being expanded with the with the construction of our facility. Um, so, as members, you will have um, a little more access to these sorts of things as well if they tie into your uh, technical or or your training efforts. There are trainings that go along with these, so helping figure out you know how you can feed Minnesota's efforts and how Minnesota can feed your efforts is. Um, something that that may come up. Um, so EWD is frankly a, you know, it's a big part of what we're doing. We have, we currently have a $10 million open call for technical work, but we have a $2 million open call for EWD work. So 20% um, is big, which I think is um, more than some people are expecting. Um, I'm sure you all were hoping for that those numbers to be flipped, but sorry. Um, you know, we we want we really do believe that this is important, uh, as are you know the legal, uh, ethical, legal, social, um, and security implications. The new modified LC uh, implications, and again, this is an area where. In my experience, there's very little training in the pipeline, um, and where Biomade would be supportive of folks developing some coursework in these areas. I, um, before joining Biomade, I was head of uh, security engagements for the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, and before that, I was in the Pentagon. So I've got deep roots in biosecurity, and I know that the you know, the research practitioners, the guys that do what I do in metabolic engineering, don't think a thing about it and they need to. Um, so figuring out how you all can help incorporate that as people come up from day one. Um, I am fortunate that I got that kind of training in uniform um, and it helped push me to where I am. But I think it's training that is increasingly more important as bioengineering becomes more and more powerful. I am afraid. How am I? How am I doing in time, Purnima? I've lost track, and I can't see it in this mode. I can't see my clock on the screen in this mode. No problem, Clem. Uh, you well. I mean, five, ten more minutes is. Great. Okay, I'm going to jump this one. You can find uh, membership materials at biomade.org. Uh, the whole package is available there, so feel free to go there. I'm also clem at biomade.org. Pretty easy to remember and I'm easy to find. Uh, I wanted to share this slide. These are the, the different organizations that supported our um, initial proposal to, to stand up Biomade. Uh, if I were a better graphic artist, this would be a pyramid, but you guys are the base of the pyramid. There's a lot of folks that are uh, part of Innovate Bio and, and the broader um, training community that, are, that were part of our effort and you are valued and you have a big place in what we're doing. 
you feed the innovation, you feed the workforce. Um, I'm really excited about uh, the opportunities that we're going to have working together. All right, and for what I think is my last slide, um, we we had a workshop in uh, in March, and um, these are sort of the general feed the the general takeaways that I had from the workshop. Um, what what did our industry members talk about as missing from their candidate pool? I, I was frankly sort of surprised that you know things like being on time and professionalism are still a, a thing, uh, but they are. So I put that on the list, uh, if, if only because it was a surprise to me. It's probably not a surprise to any of you, but um, but I don't have to go with young people. Um, and then computational. Everyone needs people who are computer literate, um, the ability to code at least simple scripts and think about things in um, in a data analytics mindset. I mean, the um, you know, biology is going to scale not only in volume, but in numbers. So um, how do you think about matrixed experiments that are hundreds to thousands of different replicates that you try in parallel is um, something that's done at the front end of the bioindustrial pipeline. And, and frankly, it's done in pharma too. So, um, you know, making sure that that is incorporated. I'm sure you guys are all over it, but uh, and it's still a clear ask every time I, I talk to employers about what's missing. Um, and then doing some cross-disciplinary training, um, you know, having some idea of what chem chemical engineering looks like, what process, you know, getting a compound purified out of your broth actually entails at scale. Um, I came from a natural products biosynthesis background, so I did a lot of uh, bench scale stuff and ran a lot of columns. A column is a kiss of death for bioindustrial processes. They're just too expensive. They're fine for pharma, but um, if you train people on a purely column chromatography, it's not uh, it's not going to answer the, the problems for much of the bioindustrial space. Um, sort of. The mirror of that is the being able to do a techno-economic analysis, even a crude one, um, you know, carbon in, carbon out sort of thinking uh, about processes was something that our industry folks wanted to see more of. People that could come in and, and do a quick kill of projects that were presented to them um, based on cost of feedstock versus cost of product. Um, you know, does something have to be 140% efficient to uh, to be economically viable? And, you know, it's there, there are easy no's out there, but people don't know how to think about that necessarily. Uh, I think I mentioned robotics before. You know, doing doing a thousand parallel experiments is tough with a pipetter, but it's pretty easy if you have a liquid handling robot, and that. Um, I know has applications in pharma for drug discovery and things like that, but um, the Bay Area has plenty of people who are looking for folks who can run TCANs and run Biomex and whatever the robot of the day is. Um, and then in the application side, figuring out what biology can do that we are not thinking of because the uh, problem I've seen for decades now is that biologists can and I kludge together pieces of biology to make just about anything that's, you know, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Um, but they have no idea what to make. I suffered this as a corporate CEO, being able to make a whole host of organic acids, but everyone wanted to dip acid. So I banged on it for a year or more to get a proof of concept. And by the time we got it, nobody wanted it. And frankly, the, the economics of it will never make sense. But um, 
that was the organic or that was the acid that the, the investors knew and that's what they wanted because they understood the market but having people that understand the opportunity that biology provides and how it how it relates to what they do so getting chemists more versed in what biology can do getting material scientists more versed in what biology can do will be extremely valuable um and something we hope that uh, you will help contribute to the biomade ecosystem and i think i will cut it off there um that was probably five minutes of insane rambling and um and open up for oh, there's our there's our uh, vision of the national network. Um, you know, Biomate is building in Minnesota, but we are looking forward um, to building pilot plants elsewhere in the country um, if we can figure out how to fund them because the country does not have nearly enough um, scaling infrastructure to, uh, to support the front end of the pipeline, the startups that want to try their things, to try their products at scale. Uh, they often get bumped by pharma who can write a big check and that is slowing down the development of a, an industry. So we are working hard to figure out how to get more pilot plants out there. And that's just going to increase the uh, number of opera training, uh, training opportunities for you all. So with that, I will uh, end and, and go to questions. Thank, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, that was wonderful. And that uh, Purnima is supposed to say that, Clem, but I couldn't help but say that since I know you so well. <laughs> well, thanks, Linnea. Thank, well, thanks from Innovate Bio there. Yeah, and I should I should thank Innovate Bio for uh, providing us not only with our uh, interim chief workforce development officer and Linnea, <laughs> but our, our actual chief, our, our permanent chief workforce development uh, officer in, in Tom Tuban. Uh, who I'm assuming is on the call, although I cannot see the full uh, selection. But uh, yeah, we... thanks, Clem. I'm on here. <laughs> thanks, Tom. I knew you were. I just uh, just couldn't see that. And I, I uh, should tell you, I should tell you, Clem, what you told me. I told Celeste. I said, you know, Clem reminded me that we are funded to do workforce in totality. That's what our funding for. But that's not true for the manufacturing institutes. And so it's Innovate's bio's job to help you guys. Outstanding. Join up. Membership. Membership. <laughs> uh, we, might have si we might sign our first member today. And I think they are coming from your community. Hey, say, Clem, I got a question. Um, yes, a little bit beyond workforce development. This is George Twaddle from Ivy Tech. Um, is Biomade interested in funding the development of some technologies that may be ideated and innovated, at least at, at, least at initial level in some of our programs? I, I'm pointing to my program in particular. We do a lot of synthetic biology competitions. Um, in the iGEM, I don't know if you're aware, um, uh, I forgot the team that won it. Um, I think it was Cambridge University where they had this really novel technology of, of um, stabilizing proteins for purification by looping them with a peptide, sort of tying the CNN terminal together and showing that this was a great way to manufacture proteins and then clipping out this little uh, stability, um, stabilizing peptide, I don't know. Uh, is Biomade? would be a funding institution for anything like that? Uh, so drive some innovation? That is not what I would consider MRL four to seven, but mm -hmm. it is a technology that can potentially solve a problem for a product that is a MRL four to seven. Mm -hmm. So if there, if you can find the right fit, that would be a technology that I could easily see being you know, a risky part of a less risky project. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I, projects have to be MRL4 to get in. Okay. Not every element of a project is going to necessarily be MRL4. Okay. I had this wild idea of using DNA origami to immobilize enzymes uh, for a finishing process, for example. Um, I just got to find a partner and start producing something with it, and then we can talk. 
that uh, that sounds fairly appropriate. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. We are hoping to have another another uh, project call out. Yeah, you know, unless you can get the white paper done in the next uh, seven hours. Uh, yeah, no, I'm otherwise I, I got a lawn to cut. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah. I get it. Sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but come on, do, George, you can do it. I, I know you can I do, can this do it, all, George. Right? Yours is like seven hours is like a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I got the hive mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all do. Um, but I, I do want to pass on, uh, uh, if you allow me to, to make one comment, Clem, about the um, projects and for the EWD, um, just to address George's question about funded projects. Um, there's a tech side that you're talking about, George, but there's also an EWD side. When you talk about the engaging the students and what you're doing to um, assist them in their understanding of what they need to know about those projects and consider whether or not the technology and the techniques that you're um, having them go through as they're developing the tech and going through the iGEM based projects and such can be applicable to an EWD um, project call. So there are a number of ways to think about interacting with, um, with Biomed for these projects and such. And I think that um, you're in a very unique position to consider uh, a variety of different approaches. I have a question. Clem, I was wondering if there's any um, interaction between the manufacturing institutes like Biomade and i -Corp. Um, Not yet, or at least not that I am privy to yet, but um, you know, we have plenty of members and plenty of folks that I've worked with over the years that have gone through i uh, training and, and Doug, our CEO, is quite well um, integrated with them. There is not an official bridge yet, but um, I expect there will be once we uh, have a little more bandwidth. I have a question too about, uh, I guess, some of your membership requirements. So we looked at that project call, right? So Todd and I were a small company of two people. Five thousand dollars to write what, <laughs> put in a white paper. It's just way too steep. So I'm wondering, is is it always going to stay that high, or are you going to reconsider? small companies, you know, <laughs> and the entrance fee. Um, there is like no, there is no <laughs> membership requirement to submit a white paper. Oh, on this well, one. the website actually says there is. Really? I could do a screenshot later, but I'll send it to you, but it does. Or for it submission, you have to be a member to do it. You have to be a member to receive funding. No, to submit a white paper. Uh, that is incorrect. Um, to submit a white paper, you do not need to be a member on this call. You will on future calls, um, but um, that is that is to be lead. Um, so right now, it's um, anybody can submit a white paper. The lead needs to be a member at the time of full proposal submission, and everyone needs to be a member at the time of uh, funding. And I, I believe you. I'm a little shocked that I. Um, have missed that on the. Well, website. I guess you'll have to extend the due date again. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Then what would I do? I got more than week? seven hours. <laughs> it's okay. Five thousand dollars to submit a proposal is still too high for us. <laughs> Even if we got the white paper through, that would be. Goodness, if there's any other questions, um, and if not, uh, thank you so much, uh, Clem. Really thank appreciate you. you coming in. All right, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Um, our, our next speaker at the session is uh, the Director of Man Manufacturing at Twist Biosciences, um, Hu Ming Wu. Welcome, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, uh, I wanted to, I, I had something a bit more pre-planned, but I think uh, I, I actually have a hard stop in about 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll actually 
uh, compress a little bit of what I was going to say and, and build actually on what Clem started to talk about. Um, so he talked a lot about the um, sort of the stages of the life cycle of companies that uh, Biomade really looks to work with. Um, at Twist in particular, uh, I, I suspect there's an MRL one to three that Clem didn't talk about. And so Twist is actually really supporting a lot of our customers that exist more of that phase. Um, when I think about, uh, particularly for synthetic biology, as well as the larger uh, biomanufacturing industry, um, I think about it from uh, a workflow of uh, starting from discovery and going into commercialization and discovery being that uh, uh, I have a problem I'm looking to solve uh, and I don't know what the solution really looks like and I have to do a lot of iteration to get there. And that's, that's where uh, Twist really, that's the space that Twist really operates. Um, as you go through that discovery process where you're running, uh, again, going back to what Clem said, uh, processes at scale. So you're going through hundreds, thousands, and even tens of thousands of experiments. Um, at some point in time, you figure out the compound or uh, organism that you actually want to work with, and then you need to transition over to scale up. Um, those are two very different types of work. Uh, I've, I've run at both ends of the spectrum. And so in my previous uh, walk of life at Trilink, um, um, using as a great example, the uh, one of the critical raw materials to the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for COVID uh, actually is the gene that encodes for the spike protein for coronavirus. Um, scaling that gene up is one set of challenges. Uh, Figuring out the gene in the first place is a completely different set of challenges. And so uh, that's the space that really Twist operates at is that uh, uh, is synthetic biology at scale. Um, much of my counterparts in the biopharma and biomanufacturing spaces talk about uh, manuf manufacturing quantities ranging from going from grams to kilograms. Uh, Twist is really focused on uh, supporting the front end research of a lot of organizations where they have thousands or tens of thousands of experiments to run and they only actually need anywhere from a nanogram to a microgram worth of material. Uh, and like I said, that, uh, that drives problems in, in uh, problem solving at, at sort of a different, uh, different dimension. Um, from a supply chain and material perspective, uh, it's actually not that much different. Uh, both types of companies need uh, uh, pallets and vats and truckloads worth of raw material uh, the main difference between, for example, a company like Twist as opposed to someone like Pfizer or Pfizer or Genentech or someone like that is that uh, at Twist, we're making uh, 10 million different snowflakes, uh, uh, one droplet at a time, whereas someone like a Pfizer or Genentech is going to make uh, exactly one compound, but they're going to make uh, you know, 10,000 liter vats worth of that, of that one thing. Uh, and so that's um, that's sort of a, a key difference between the spaces that uh, Twist operates at versus uh, many many of the other uh, larger brand names in the uh, in biopharma space. Um, as uh, as Clem mentioned in particular, uh, uh, for most of my career, I've done uh, some uh, DNA uh, custom DNA work in some manner or form. Um, the traditional mode of manufacturing uh, custom DNA in particular is, uh, is on-column synthesis and on-column purification. Um, uh, typically for making gram to kilogram scale, um, those operations kind of look like your favorite. Uh, if, if, if you live in a city with uh, microbreweries and you walk in, you see big steel vats uh, up to the ceiling, you see columns the size of uh, uh, a water main. Um, uh, On-column synthesis for DNA looks similar to that, and the only real difference is that uh, is how big the column is. And so, um, most uh, traditional manufacturers of DNA are using columns uh, about the size of my my index finger. Uh, and so, if you picture basically a strand of DNA being manufactured in a column of DNA that's again the size of my finger, um, typical cost for that kind of thing runs, you know, something on the order of anywhere from 50 cents to maybe $5, uh, $5 a base. Um, um, now, when you imagine that uh, if I'm a researcher and I have a hundred base, uh, hundred base uh, sequence of DNA, so that's, that's, you know, I'm paying anywhere from 
$500 to almost $1,000 uh, per strand. And I'm doing it all in straws that look like this. And so uh, if I only have $10,000 to spend, my $10,000 doesn't go very far if I'm, if I'm spending it $1,000 at a time. And uh, where Twist is really focused on is again, driving that uh, numbers of scale. Uh, and so uh, our proprietary uh, manufacturing process actually involves um, uh, manufacturing DNA on silicon. Uh, so, um, and there's, uh, there's lots of resources on the internet that you can Google and, and um, I won't go into that in too much detail here, but uh, what that really enables is to drive the cost per DNA down by orders of magnitude. So whereas um, a, uh, a strand of DNA for, or for experimental design might cost you say $1,000 at uh, somewhere else, and you're gonna get 10 to 20 times more material than you actually need to do your experiment. Uh, Twist really focuses on getting, getting you anywhere from, again, like I said, nanograms to micrograms worth of DNA. Um, and, we're giving it, uh, and we're doing it for, you know, around a uh, hundred bucks, a uh, hundred bucks per DNA. And uh, by really increasing the order of magnitude and decreasing the cost by that same order of magnitude. So, Whereas before, a lot of our customers have to be very choosy about their research and saying, well, I'd love to evaluate a thousand targets, but I only have enough budget to do 10 of them. So I really hope I guess correctly. Um, at Twist, we really just say, no, like design, design whatever you need. Uh, if you want to design 10,000 sequences, go right ahead. Uh, and then that really helps our customers in the discovery process to really iterate, um, uh, iterate in a much more rapid fashion. So. Uh, that lets our customers do things like, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look for this specific uh, mutation uh, that's of interest, or I'm trying to design a, an organism that does a specific thing. I kind of know what it looks like, so I design 10,000 sequences and I try them all, and I actually don't care if they work, if they, if they all work. I just need to get 100 or so that work, and once I get that 100 out of 10,000 that work, I take those 100 and I design another thousand that look like that 100, and I repeat that uh, that cycle of. Uh, design a large, uh, design a large set of sequences, uh, test it out in my in, in my high throughput processes, and, and and build upon that from there. Um, so that's uh, that's a little bit about uh, about twist and what we do. Um, again, kind of echoing what Clem said in terms of uh, as, as a very specific employer in the space. Um, I, I can say that particularly process at scale in terms of numbers and. And I would add on the the um, the cross disciplinary skill to, uh, as I always joke about the the uh, I've I've seen lots of arguments between the chemist and the biologist, uh, and so uh, a chemist who understands a little bit of biology, or a biologist who understands a little bit of chemistry, or an engineer who understands a little bit of the uh, the, the science side, um, that's the kind of thing where where um particularly in the in the biomanufacturing space that that those are those are key critical thinking skills that that i'm looking for all the time um we're at about uh 15 after uh, i'll uh i'll actually shut up now and uh, uh I'll, I'll i'll i'm happy to take questions or or expand upon uh other other topics that folks wanted to hear about Apparently, I uh, I did uh, I rambled on for a little bit too long. No, not at all. People are just probably thinking about their questions. Well, uh, this is Chimdi Klo. Hi, uh, good to see you again. I, I wanted to add that uh, we have students that work for Twist, and it's a great company to work for. That uh, they they really support their employees, and the employees all uh, enjoy working there. I don't know if you can answer this, but uh, did Twist uh, produce the sequence for either Moderna and or Pfizer for their vaccine? Uh, I do not, actually do not know the answer to that question. I, uh, I started at Twist, uh, I've been at Twist since uh, early December this past year. And so 
I, uh, uh, that work would have happened probably a year or so prior. Uh, I can say that uh, um, exactly uh, as Clem kind of referenced. So uh, for much of the past two years prior, I was uh, at my previous company, I was taking a small molecule that had previously only been made at uh, milligram scale for the equivalent of, I think a million bucks per gram. Um, by the time, by the time we got that scaled up to the quantities uh, and price points that uh, that the long supply chain that ended up that ends up leading to the Pfizer Moderna vaccine goes into, it was we'd gone from milligram quantities to to milligrams a month to kilograms a month, and and from a cost of millions of dollars per gram down to down to tens of thousands. Uh, so again, um, you know, at the at the other end of the spectrum where you're making the one thing and you need to and you need to uh, do that really well. Um, um, there's a whole host of other uh, other skills and requirements that that support that end of it. Uh, and and both are both both sides of that are actually equally essential to the to um, to the uh, biomanufacturing industry. And is the cost reduction really a matter of process development and optimization? Is, is that how you realize that dramatic cost reduction? Uh, in both cases, both at Twist and at, uh, and at my previous companies, um, the cost reductions typically come in terms of economies of scale, um, on, in terms of the but, uh, scale in either dimension of uh, numbers or of uh, quantity. Uh, on the number side at Twist, um, uh, certainly when I was a, once upon a long time ago, when I was in school, uh, I was taught things to do the old fashioned way by, by hand pipetter. And so you'd spend two months slaving over a lab bench to, to, um, to make your first designer E. coli, and then you enter industry and you realize that uh, industry does this 96 with 384 at a time. Um, twist uh, goes several, several multiples of two beyond that these days. And so um, on that side, uh, driving down the cost per base for, for uh, custom genes and custom DNA is really a more about um, Fitting, fitting more snow, fitting more snowflakes onto the same piece of real estate, and so that's actually a key part of twist technology of printing on silicon. Where, again, as I talked about, uh, traditional manufacturing, you're making a DNA in something the size of my finger, um, and it's more about miniaturizing that process so that I'm making hundreds of thousands of DNA on on a feature that's basically the size of a uh, a, a dot. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one side of driving uh, cost per unit down. Uh, on the other side, which is uh, a bit more of the, I think the more traditional biomanufacturing courses that are typically offered in the educational system, uh, um, particularly in industry, most of the cost in making anything is not actually the raw material. It's actually the facility, the people and all of the supporting structure. The, from an industry perspective, uh, for example, if something costs a hundred bucks a gram, uh, 70 to $80 of that is literally just me looking at it. Uh, and so whether, whether industry is making, uh, hundred grams, a kilogram or 10 kilograms, <laughs> it all actually costs about the same. And so recognizing, uh, drastic reductions in price per unit is actually more about uh, driving a series of 10x scale-ups through, uh, through that process. Uh, again, uh, for any of you who, uh, like myself, who bake with their kids at home, uh, it's one thing to bake one cupcake. Uh, it's another to uh, bake a large vat of it for, uh, for the kid's birthday party. And having uh, recently messed that up, I can say that uh, uh, the uh, engineering challenges of scaling up to larger batches aren't trivial. I'm going to steal your metaphor. <laughs> but cupcake. Well, come, what's well, in theory? What's the lowest that you could go for price? Price per or uh, price per set, and then price per um, sequence. 
Um, price per sequence. Uh, so currently, Twist is running at for for jeans. We are running at I think a 10, 10 cents per base, being a being a, a nice round number. Uh, we are driving towards a vision of getting that down to sub sub one cent per base. Uh, that's where we really start talking about uh, our our founder and CEO, or one of our founders and CEO, uh, Emily LaProust, has a great TED talk that you can Google later, where she talks about DNA data storage. Um, I was actually going to play play that for this uh, uh, for this call, but uh, I was sensitive to time. But um, uh, that's that's a world where um, storing data in silicon, where you, where you're basically storing data in ones and zeros in electronic format. Uh, whereas storing DNA in DNA, you have access to basically four characters, A, C, G, and T. And so that exponentially increases the amount of data you can store. The problem is that storing data via DNA, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to Jim earlier, so that, that currently costs about 10 cents a base right now. Whereas doing it in silicon is at the, is at the sub, sub penny. And so that's where we see needing to drive down to where that uh, uh, storage of data via DNA is competitive with where the, uh, uh, where the semiconductor industry is trying to get to as well. But you're saying that you'll, you'll, you'll probably be able to get this uh, per base pair down very low. But again, when you do this, this set, to, to just manipulate it stuff, that's that's your $98 per $100 that you're looking at. And so you, even if though, if you get it real, the price down real low per base pair, you're still gonna have to pay a certain amount to, to have a set done. Uh, that's correct, exactly. So exactly as you say, my, my fixed costs are usually what drive most of the costs in an organization. And so whether I'm, uh, and, and particularly for our technology, it's more about squeezing more DNA into the same space. And so, the machines that do that, the people that run the machines, the building that holds the machines, the uh, the tanks of chemicals that feed all of that, um, that that all costs the same whether we're, whether we're doing uh, 100 sequences, 1,000 sequences, or a million sequences. And so uh, a lot of the uh, work that happens at Twist is then uh, goes to okay, we're we're squeezing in 10,000 sequences on this, you know, per 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 square foot. Uh, arbitrarily, uh, and how do we get that to 100,000 or a million sequences per square foot? And then what level of education would you like your technicians to to have? And, and then uh, would somebody taking a year, getting a, uh, taking a year long class and getting a certificate, uh, um, would you hire somebody like that to kind of run your equipment? Uh, I would love someone, I, I love hiring folks from the community college system with uh, biotechnology certificates. Uh, I'll be pretty upfront. Uh, uh, in every company I've been in in biotech, uh, I've always had an urgent need to hire personnel. And so I take anybody that we can train. Uh, and so the community college system is great because the curriculum helps to provide that training pre-built and I don't have to spend the time doing it myself. Um, but uh, particularly going to professionalism and uh, and eagerness to work. I think that's always the first thing I'm always looking for. Uh, I, uh, I think on uh, when I w when uh, along with Jim and several others on this call when uh, we were doing our sort of virtual career fair, uh, I, I, I mentioned I, I actually really love uh, speaking with folks from the uh, food service industry uh, because I kind of look at uh, particularly at Twist where we operate in terms of uh, um, uh, numbers. Um, if you if you can uh, juggle six tables, uh, uh, run five orders back and forth, uh, bust a table at the same time, and not drop a glass along the way, uh, I actually do want to talk to you because if I replace the word uh, glass, table, and drinks with uh, DNA plates and uh, reagents, that's actually a lot of what uh, that's actually a lot of what uh, my manufacturing staff have to do. I knew, work, you know, I knew working in the food service and carrying all those <laughs> plates when I was going through college would be beneficial to my lab experience. Mm -hmm. um, I scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins. Does that count? <laughs> Just that kidding. Does, uh, you know, uh, maybe for a different talk, I actually use ice cream as a great metaphor for the actual process of manufacturing DNA. Um, it poses some very specific challenges on 
uh, on the supply chain side as well as order fulfillment. And, and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, there's looks like 30 or 40 people on the call and all of you, all of us have different DNA. Uh, and particularly our customers want to, it, it is really a business of making snowflakes. And so kind of like the ice cream shop, uh, I know I'm going to sell ice cream today. I do not know exactly what flavors are going to be are going to be sold that day. I've got a pretty good idea that I'm usually going to sell vanilla, but every once in a while someone walks in and says, I want bubblegum and pistachio. And I look down and I said, well, I don't have any bubblegum and pistachio today. So what do I tell you? Well, I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, can I ask you a really quick question? I, I, your talk was amazing. Um, but my question is, is, is a follow-up to what Nick was asking about. And this is more of the um, imbalance or maybe the, uh, the positions that are open versus your applicants. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to maybe the qualifications or you know, are you getting the candidates that you want to when you have an advertised position? Or are there is any issues that you're encountering maybe that you can share or enlighten the group about? I think, uh, and this is actually um, this is actually consistent with uh, all the organizations I've been at through throughout my manufacturing career. Um, I think my one of the biggest challenges that uh, whether it's uh, biopharma, uh, biomanufacturing, or life sciences, um, I do I have found that especially in the past maybe three or four years or so um, uh, with sort of the current current crops of folks coming through the school system, uh, the concept that uh, that manufacturing in particular kind of run, needs to run like a hospital. Um, so the, the 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 shop runs on Thanksgiving, the shop runs during Christmas, the shop runs on New Year's, and someone needs to go work that day. And so I can't tell you how many applicants that I talked to where. I talk about, hey, we run 24 seven, here are the shifts. Uh, everybody puts in a weekend day or a night or something in between. And I can't tell you how many applicants with, who kind of nod their heads through that. And then we make them an offer. And then they, they look at the, 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 the times that we say, and they call, they call the recruiter back and say, uh, something to the extent of, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were serious that I had to work on Saturdays. Um, So I think that's a, that, that kind of crosses uh, all the companies I've been in, and that's been a pretty consistent theme of what uh, um, now the folks that, uh, that do get through, um, you know, it, it's, it's just a tremendous group of folks that, that come through the system. And, and I always look at uh, biotech in particular being a great accelerator to um, understanding about science, understanding about industry and, and just a great career accelerator. Um, but I do... I, you know, I do see ironically that the barrier to entry is more around people's mindset about like, you know, I'm kind of expecting to go into science and work a nine to five job, a nine to five Monday to Friday job. And, and I think that's the thing that uh, I really try and, and, and connect back and say, look, like, um, we'll teach you the, you know, all, all the biopharma, biotech, uh, life sciences companies are doing, are doing cutting edge work that in partnership with the uh, academic institutions. And, and you're not going to learn any of that in school. Um, and so we're more than happy to teach the very specific nuances of our technology. Um, the things that we can't teach, uh, can you come into work? Can you work these hours? Are you willing to learn? Can you multitask? Um, that's, that's, that's something that's, that's applicable everywhere. Are the 12 hour shifts a barrier as well? When someone takes a look at that? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I've run 12. Um, I've run uh, currently at Twist, we run 12s. Uh, a lot of other companies in life sciences run eights. So I've, I've done both. Um, the um, Whether it's 12 or eight, uh, to, what I found is it's less the 12 versus eight, and it's more the Saturday, Sunday, and nights. Um, particularly for, for certain sections of the demographic, especially as we exit COVID, there's a premium, there's a premium that's, that's placed by being able to hang out with your friends and do whatever needs to be done on Friday night. And, uh, um, having been young once, I, 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 I don't disagree with what goes on, but, uh, um, I, 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 uh, I, uh, at, 
one point in my career, uh, I was a, I was a night shift manager for, for a good year and a half or so. So uh, I, I kind of smile and say, well, that's nice. You, you know, you make your choices and I made mine and we'll go from there. Uh, I do have a bit of a hard stop. Uh, I, I have okay. another, uh, I do have another work related call, but uh, I think several of you do know how to get in touch with me uh, if needed. And I'm always happy to chat more and uh, feel free to uh, feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, um, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank it was you great thank you for thank joining you. us. Yeah, that was just great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Amazing company.